In this video, I'll show you how to use a Planck calorimeter to determine the standard enthalpy of formation of sugar at room temperature. I'll focus on the calculations. First, I looked up the molar mass, the enthalpy of combustion, the enthalpy of formation of sugar from these references. So first, I'll show you this reference, webbook.nist.gov. Uh, this is a government website uh, that publishes a lot of thermodynamic uh, data for many chemicals, including sucrose. Here's the formula, molecular weight, and uh, the structure. If you're interested in the three-dimensional structure, uh, it's right here. So you just click that JavaScript. You can see the three-dimensional structure. And also uh, sugar or table sugar has perhaps 30 other names over here, okay? Uh, and then if you're interested in the thermochemistry data of sugar in the solid or liquid phase, click here, right? And then over here, phase change data, reaction data, infrared. Uh, if you scroll down, you can see some uh, thermodynamic data of solid sugar here, enthalpy of formation. Enthalpy of combustion, enthalpy of combustion, enthalpy of combustion. Uh, These three values are very close to each other. They are published in 1930s, 1960s. Uh, over here, this is uh, reanalyzed by these two authors in 1970. So I include this and this data in my document. Right, right here, these two values. Now, how can we determine the enthalpy of formation of sucrose? Well, we'll use a Planck calorimeter to carry out the combustion reaction of sucrose. So how is combustion related to the formation reaction? So when we're talking about the enthalpy, enthalpy of formation, that's relative to the pure elements. So in this case, for sugar, the enthalpy of formation of sugar, this number, is relative to pure elements, graphite, hydrogen gas, and oxygen gas at 25 degrees Celsius. And also, the graphite, the hydrogen gas, and the oxygen gas should all be in the standard state. Uh, that means we have one bar O2, one bar H2, and also, this graphite should be under one bar pressure. Uh, this is very difficult to achieve. It's very difficult to form su uh, sugar from pure elements. So instead, uh, we are combusting the sucrose. And because enthalpy is a state function, we can write this equation. The enthalpy of combustion of sugar So carbon 12, H22, oxygen 11, this is enthalpy of combustion of sugar. This is equal to the enthalpy of formation of the products, uh, including 12 CO2 and 11 water, and then minus the reactants, the enthalpy of sugar. minus 12 times enthalpy of formation of O2. Uh, we'll do this combustion reaction at 25 degree Celsius. And then the enthalpy of formation of O2, this part, is zero. Okay, this is zero. Why? Because the UPAC choose pure elements to be the zero reference for the definition of enthalpy of formation. So the enthalpy of formation of pure elements in their most stable state of aggregation, uh, in their standard state at room temperature, is exactly zero. It's defined to be zero. Uh, now we can look up, oh, I forgot water here. We can look up the enthalpy of formation and enthalpy of formation of water and CO2, also from the NIST website. 
Uh, let's see, this is water, uh, negative 285.83, I'll copy that here. Uh, make sure you choose liquid, liquid phase for water. And if you are writing a paper, cite the resource. Uh, what about CO2? Well, again, we can look it up. Uh, I will enter the formula for CO2, CO2, uh, search. At the room temperature, CO2 is in the gas phase. Let's see. Uh, we're going to look at gas phase thermal chemistry data. Uh, there are two values here. Uh, we'll use the more recent number, 1998. So negative 393.52. Again, cite the reference, please. Now over here, uh, we have zero here. Uh, this is given, this is given. Uh, to determine the enthalpy of formation of sucrose, we just need to know the combustion heat of sucrose okay in a standard state under the isobaric condition because we know q sub p is equal to delta h for a reaction q sub v is equal to delta u of a reaction so if you do the chemical reaction under the isobaric condition then the enthalpy change of the reaction is equal to the heat of the reaction However, if the reaction is carried out under the isochoric condition, then Q sub V is equal to delta U. So we'll get back to this later. For now, I just want to convince you that uh, if you can somehow determine the enthalpy of combustion for sucrose, you'll be able to get the enthalpy of formation of sucrose. Okay. Now let's uh, talk about the plan calorimeter. Uh, in a plant calorimeter, the combustion reaction is done uh, under the isochoric condition. So if you measure the heat flow uh, into or out of the chemical reaction system, it's actually delta U. So you will be able to determine uh, delta U of sucrose. And then, how can we go from delta U to delta H? Well, H is U plus PV. So delta H is delta U plus delta PV. All right? And then, in this case, delta HC in a standard state. Okay? In a standard state. Uh, this C stands for combustion. Plus delta PV. Uh, over here, this is delta PV per mole uh, sugar, per mole sugar. All right, this is because when we're talking about enthalpy of reaction, uh, when we're talking about internal energy of reaction, uh, they are typically in kilojoule per mole. We are referring to uh, the combustion of one mole sugar uh, in this case. How can we estimate this delta PV? How can we measure this delta PV? Well, one way is you, you just, uh, because the reaction is done um, under the isochoric conditions, so it's just PV final minus PV initial, and the volume is constant, so really it's just P final minus P initial. All right, so you can measure the initial pressure, you can measure the final pressure. Okay, take the difference, you get this value. Uh, also, you can estimate delta PV. Uh, delta PV is equal to delta PV of gases. So over here, uh, all these uh, gases, solids, and, and liquids, uh, they have uh, the same pressure or fuse the same pressure. Uh, but the volumes of liquids and solids 
are much smaller than the volume of gases. So when we are talking about the PV of the system, we can simply neglect the PV of solids and the PV of liquids. All right, so that's why we can do this approximation. And also we can uh, assume the ideal gas behavior. So for gases, PV is roughly in RT. And somehow if you make sure the reaction temperature is around 25 degrees. It's roughly a constant. And then we can take RT out of the parenthesis. All right. And all we need to know is the change in the number of moles of gases uh, per mole reaction. Uh, for this chemical reaction, uh, if you count the number of moles of gases on the left hand side, it's 12. Uh, do not count solids. On the right hand side, it's also 12. Do not count this liquid. And then in this case, well, it's actually zero uh, for the combustion of sucrose. So we're just lucky here. Now in this case, if we determine the internal energy of combustion, um, and then we can get the enthalpy of combustion directly because uh, they differ by approximately zero. We made three approximations uh, in this derivation. Uh, if you want to get a more accurate number, well, this V is the volume of the uh, reaction system. So that's the volume of the inside of the bomb in the Planck calorimeter. You just need to measure the initial pressure, the final pressure. They are about the, the same. They're roughly the same. Well, again, this is because um, you're not going to change the number of moles of gases uh, before and after the combustion. You go from 12O2 to 12CO2. That means if you combust uh, one mole sucrose, 12 moles of O2 will be consumed, but at the same time, 12 moles of CO2 will be produced. All right. And, and then again, we neglect the change of the volume for solids or liquids. It's just very small compared to gases. All right, and then how can we get this delta U? Uh, very simple, what we need to do is do this. You need the number of moles of sucrose. All right, and then you uh, measure the amount of combustion heat. Uh, pay attention, this is a negative number, this is a positive number, so this should be less than zero. All right. Uh, it's very, very easy to obtain this value, the number of moles. Uh, you just weigh your sample, get the mass, and we have the molar mass here from the NIST website, and then we determine the number of moles. Uh, the reaction heat. Uh, to determine the reaction heat, uh, we'll have to use a water bath to, okay, I think uh, I need to, insert a few blank pages to continue. All right, over here. Okay, I'll write this equation again. Uh, this is internal energy change of the combustion. Uh, this is the combustion heat of sucrose over the number of moles of sucrose. Uh, this part is less than zero, the number of moles is greater than zero, so this guy is negative. Okay. But then how can we uh, determine the amount of heat? released 
from the su sugar sample. Uh, well, it's very difficult to measure the amount of heat directly, so we're going to use a water bath to absorb the heat. So in a calorimeter, we have the bomb here, and we have the sample. This is sucrose. Somehow we need to ignite the sucrose, so we need some fuse wire. And then we need electrodes. Uh, they are connected to a ignition unit. Okay, and you have a button here. This is ignition unit. This is used to ignite the sugar sample. And again, it's very difficult to measure the amount of heat directly. So really, we're going to immerse uh, the bomb inside water. All right, so water is going to be used to absorb the heat. So really, if you know the heat capacity of water and you know the temperature change of water, you know how much heat flows into water. And then we can determine this Q. However, uh, we should uh, pay close attention to this setup. Okay, this is a bomb. We have water, and uh, water is inside a bucket. Okay, we put the bucket inside the calorimeter. The calorimeter is well insulated from air. But the problem is this. Not only water absorbs heat. The bucket, uh, the bomb itself, also absorbs heat. And it's tedious to measure the heat capacity of water, the bucket, and also to make sure the uh, temperature is even inside the calorimeter. We need a stirrer. And the stirrer itself absorbs heat. The air absorbs heat. And one more thing, we need to insert a thermometer uh, into the calorimeter to monitor the temperature change of water. So that makes this really complicated. So the thing is, we just need to determine C, the heat capacity of everything uh, inside the calorimeter. All right, C, everything inside the calorimeter. Uh, the unit is, uh, you can use joule per kelvin or kilojoule per kelvin or kilojoule per degree or joule per de uh, degree Celsius, either way, okay? Just use your, uh, use the unit consistently, all right? And this is really tedious to write, so I'm gonna just use C, all right? So if I know the heat capacity of everything inside the calorimeter C and multiply the temperature change of the calorimeter before and after the combustion, uh, isn't this just the amount of heat that flows into uh, the calorimeter, and that's the amount of heat flows out of the reaction system, right? So we can we can have this equation. Uh, this is positive, but I just want to make sure that you understand that there is a, a change of sign here. Okay, this is negative. This is positive. So I just want to make sure that you understand uh, why I use the absolute sign. Well, it's just to avoid confusion. I'm just saying that the amount of heat released from the reaction is equal to the amount of heat absorbed by everything inside the calorimeter. All right? Uh, but don't forget that we used a, a piece of fuse wire to ignite, to ignite this uh, sucrose. Okay, so now we get a more accurate equation here. Uh, how do you determine the amount of heat released from the fuse wire? Usually you just measure the initial length and final length of the fuse wire. You take the difference, you know how much is combusted. And then there's a, usually a conversion factor uh, provided by the manufacturer of the fuse wire. So you just do the conversion, all right? Usually this part is a uh, much smaller number than this part, usually, okay, usually. So really, if you know C, okay, let's see, let's say C is available to us, all right? And then you can somehow determine the amount of heat from the fuse wire, uh, and then you just measure the temperature change 
of the reaction system, you'll be able to get this. Once you get this, and you know it's negative, put a negative sign in front of this, and plug it into this equation, and you get the uh, internal energy change of the combustion of sucrose. So that's it. Okay, now, uh, here are two issues. One with the determination of C, one with the determination of delta T. So you may say, well, delta T isn't that simple. Delta T is just T final minus T initial, right? So uh, before ignition, uh, let's say, well, we have a perfectly insulated calorimeter. Uh, the temperature change is zero. Okay, so I'm going to draw a thermogram here. And then I ignite the sample. Combustion heat is released. The water absorbs the heat, therefore the temperature goes up. Right? And eventually the temperature will level off. Right? So over here, this is my T final. Over here, this is T initial. And then delta T is just T final over T initial. Right? Well, it's, um, it's pretty good if you just need to get a, a rough estimate of delta T. Uh, because when we use this plant calorimeter, it is well insulated, but it's not perfectly insulated. So outside the calorimeter, there's air, all right? And there's always heat exchange between the inside of the calorimeter and the air outside. So when we design this experiment, uh, we want to make sure that the initial water temperature is lower than air. After combustion, the water temperature is higher than the air temperature. So hopefully, the heat flow will cancel. Heat flows into the calorimeter before the combustion. Heat flows out of the calorimeter after the combustion. So it's a better design. But still, I mean, what if they don't cancel exactly? Well, then we need to take the heat exchange between the calorimeter and the air into account. So assuming our initial temperature of this water bath is lower than air, then heat flows in, heat flows in. If heat flows into the calorimeter, and then when we draw our thermal thermogram, T time, if heat flows in, and then we should observe a slightly positive slope uh, before we even ignite the sample. And then at here, at this point, we ignite the sample, and then temperature goes up and reaches T final. So this is when we ignite the sample, this is the final temperature, right? But over here, pay attention here. Uh, the temperature may increase due to the heat flow from the room air to the calorimeter. And after the combustion, okay, after the combustion, well, the temperature of the bomb, okay, the temperature of the water bath, the temperature of the bucket, assuming they're uniform, they're higher than the room air temperature. So over here, you may observe a temperature decrease. All right, so delta T. Okay, again, this is due to the heat flow from the air to the calorimeter. This is due to the heat flow from the inside of the calorimeter to the air. And where's the room temperature? Maybe, maybe somewhere here, okay? I don't know. And then what we need to do is we need to uh, look at this delta T, and we need to subtract the temperature change caused by the heat flow. So if this is the room temperature from here to here, okay, we're going to assume heat flows into this calorimeter, okay, and causes some temperature change. And how do we uh, compute this? Well, this is the room temperature, so I'm going to just use room here. And then I'm going to label this three different times as A, B, C, okay? And then I'm going to say, well, between time A and time B, heat flows from the room air to the inside of the calorimeter at a rate R1. So I need to subtract R1. 
okay and the time period is from a to b and over here from b to c we assume heat flows out of the calorimeter all right uh, and uh, uh, that would uh, cause the temperature change uh, in this expression, R2 times C minus B. R2, again, is the rate of the temperature change uh, between B and C. That is entirely due to the heat flow from the calorimeter to air. So again, we need to subtract uh, the temperature change caused by the uh, heat flow first from the air to the calorimeter and then from the calorimeter to the air okay so this is before uh, the temperature of the water bath reaches the room air temperature this is after uh, the water bath temperature uh, reaches the room air temperature all right and how do we determine this R1 R2 there's no way for us to determine R1 and R2 directly so that's why we're going to use this period, okay? We're going to use this period. We'll call this pre-period, before the combustion. And we'll also use the data from the post-period, that's after the combustion, to estimate R1 and R2. So very simple, uh, in this pre-period, uh, we didn't ignite the sample yet. So this R1 is due to the heat flow from the air to the calorimeter. All right, so if we measure the temperature change during the pre-period, uh, we can determine R1, okay? And then if you look at the post-period, okay, this is after the combustion uh, finished and the water temperature uh, reaches its maximum. And then it may level off, it may uh, start to decrease slowly. And then we can determine the slope of the temperature change uh, in the post-period, that's R2. So both R1 and R2 are estimated using the data from the pre-period and the post-period. They are not really the temperature change between A and B or the temperature change between B and C due to the heat flow between the calorimeter and air. Okay, those are just estimates, all right? But still, I mean, with... Uh, estimated R1 and R2 uh, by formulating this new expression, we will be able to get more accurate delta T. All right, so if you just use this, Tf minus T initial, you'll get a reasonably accurate delta T. But if you use this formula, uh, you'll get a more accurate delta T. Uh, and if you look up the menu for the calorimeter, they usually will tell you uh, how to find this time B, okay? Uh, usually, uh, if you get a plant calorimeter from uh, the PAR company, P-A-R-R, -R, uh, I think the time B is uh, uh, when the temperature increase. So, over here, this is about 65% of the total increase, all right? This is just a rough estimate. Uh, this 65%, of the total temperature change uh, is determined by the power company uh, empirically. So I think they did experiments and 65% uh, seems to be a, a good number for us to determine time B. All right, but you know, we can also roughly estimate uh, time B for our calculation. Now this is uh, the issue with delta T. Okay, you can just use T final minus T initial to uh, get a reasonably accurate delta T. But also you can get more va more accurate value for delta T by subtracting the temperature change caused by the heat flow between the calorimeter and the room air. Again, this is because the calorimeter, although well insulated, it's not perfectly insulated. Uh, another problem is C. Okay, how do we know the value of C? Well, again, if you look up the menu provided by the manufacturer of the plant calorimeter, I think they will tell you uh, the value of C of uh, the calorimeter. So that's everything inside the calorimeter. But then you may ask, well, doesn't that depend on the heat capacity of water and therefore 
depending on the amount of water. Yes, uh, you can always uh, use the same amount of water in every single trial, and then the heat capacity C of everything inside the calorimeter will be a constant. So I think either the company will assume that two kilograms of water uh, will be used and then give you a value for C for everything inside the calorimeter, including two kilograms of water, or simply uh, it's gonna exclude this water bath and give you the heat capacity of everything inside the calorimeter, not including water. So either way, uh, you can easily compute the C. Uh, but for educational purposes, uh, students, physical chemistry students, are often required to measure C. Now, how do we measure C? Well, C is the heat capacity of everything inside the calorimeter, including water bath. So why don't we just, you know, combust a standard chemical with known internal energy of combustion, right? So we're gonna just have a standard. Uh, in this case, we're gonna use benzoic acid, all right? And then uh, we just look up the internal energy of combustion of benzoic acid, all right? And then divided by delta T. So BA stands for benzoic acid. It's a very stable compound at the room temperature, uh, but uh, in pure oxygen at, after ignition, benzoic acid uh, can combust completely and form CO2 and water. So why don't we just use this standard, okay, to determine the heat capacity of the calorimeter. Uh, be sure that you use the same amount of water uh, between the benzoic acid trials and the sugar trials. Okay, uh, hopefully you remember this. Uh, not only benzoic acid will combust, a piece of fuselage may combust as well. Again, you need to measure the initial and the final length of the fuselage, and then you take the difference. You know how much fuselage is combusted. And then find the conversion factor from the length of the fuselage to the amount of heat released from the fuselage. Okay, usually a conversion factor will be provided by the manufacturer of the fuse wire. Okay, so this is easy to do. You just measure the mass of benzoic acid. All you need to know is uh, the internal energy change of the combustion of benzoic acid in kilojoule per mole. Uh, what about delta T? Again, delta T can be determined using this equation. Okay, this will give you fairly accurate delta T. Now, how do we get this? Uh, usually this is not given to you directly uh, because if you are a chemist, you do most chemical reactions not under the isochoric condition but under, under the isobaric condition, okay, under the room air pressure because that's safe, that's safe. And again, if it's isobaric, if it's isochoric, we have different equations, all right? And again, because uh, typically we do reactions under isobaric condition. So very often the enthalpy change of the reactions are available to us. So over here, same here. The enthalpy of combustion of BA is often available to us. Again, you can look up this value from your physical chemistry textbook or from the NIST website. Uh, if you have a copy of the CRC Handbook of Chemistry and Physics. Uh, that's a very reliable resource as well. But anyway, I'll just give you a value here I found in a textbook. So it's this. Now the problem is, this is the enthalpy of combustion. We need the internal energy of combustion. What's the difference? minus delta PV. Okay, over here, this is actually uh, the change of PV per mole BA, 
per mobile. So we have some more work to do. Uh, for benzoic acid, it may react with oxygen and form water and CO2 as well. This is in liquid phase, this is gas phase. This is in the gas phase, this is in the solid phase. So when we look at this equation, we need to balance the equation carefully. Okay, and be sure to use just a coefficient of one here. This is because when we're talking about the enthalpy of combustion of BA, we're talking about one mole BA that undergoes the combustion reaction may release 3,227 3, kilojoule. Okay, that amount of heat per mole benzoic acid. So if you put a 2 here, okay, and then 15 here, 14 here, 6 here, well, you'll have to double this. You'll have to double this. So it's not, in, uh, it's not very convenient. All right, so what I will do is I'll just always keep a coefficient of 1 in front of the sample of interest. And then look at this equation, you will see delta N gases is negative 0 0.5. Uh, this is unitless. This is because, again, we're talking about this delta PV per mole BA, okay, per mole BA. So if we're assuming one mole of benzoic acid, combusts in oxygen, the initial number of moles of gas is 7.5, the final number of moles is 7, the change is negative 0.5 moles per mole BA. So uh, that's why this value is unitless. And once we get this value, we can estimate uh, this delta PV per mole BA is roughly RT, delta N gases. Okay, again, this is a rough estimate of delta PV. We made several approximations. And you should be able to justify the three approximations and estimate the errors introduced by using these three approximations. All right, so again, given the enthalpy of combustion of BA, we can compute the internal energy change of the combustion of benzoic acid in kilojoule per mole. Okay? And then you plug it in here, you have the number of moles of benzoic acid. You get the total amount of heat over here. This is the total amount of heat released from this amount of BA. Over here, this is the heat from the fuel swirl. Sum it up, you get the total amount of heat released from the combustion of BA and the fuse. Divided by delta T, you get C. You get the heat capacity. Again, I want to emphasize that uh, if you just use this equation, you get a reasonably accurate delta T. Uh, but if you use this corrected equation, uh, the value of delta T will be more accurate. It's going to be more accurate because you take the heat flow between the calorimeter and the room air into account in this equation. Although R1 and R2 are estimated, okay? Although these two are estimated, but still uh, this equation turns out to be more accurate than just T final minus T initial. Okay, now if we have the C, we get back to here. Now C, uh, assuming C is determined uh, for the sugar combustion, okay? So you'll do uh, several trials for sugar, several trials for benzoic acid. From the trials of the combustion of benzoic acid, you can determine the C, all right? And then you do the sugar trials. Uh, you use C times delta T. Again, this delta T uh, should be uh, calculated using this equation. If you want more accurate result, okay, 
and then you get the total amount of heat okay released from sugar and from fuse wire so you need to know this Q fuse as well and then you can determine the Q released from the combustion of sugar okay and uh, this number is a negative number okay this is combustion heat so this is actually a negative number plug this in here you determine the internal energy change of the combustion of sugar okay and then we learned how to go from the internal energy change of the combustion to the enthalpy change of the combustion okay they differ by delta PV per mole sugar okay and then we go from enthalpy of combustion to the enthalpy of formation Finally, after you determine the enthalpy of combustion and enthalpy of formation of sugar, you should compare your numbers with the uh, literature values. So from uh, this book, Thermochemistry of Organic and Organometallic Compounds, uh, to see if your numbers match with the literature values. And if they differ significantly, let's say if they differ by 50 kilojoule per mole, well, uh, your experiment is not very accurate.